Morning, Doug. Hi, how are you? I'm hanging in there. <laughs> by a thread? <laughs> oh, by, by B cells, T cells, and uh, um, whatever hasn't been killed by the chemotherapy. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, yes, by a thread. The fact that we're alive at all is such an amazing thing. That is an amazing thing. I'm grateful for it every morning I wake up. I love that I stepped into the conversation right as I heard that. That made my week, Doug. <laughs> that totally made my week. Terrific. Wow. Good morning to uh, you, Jerry. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. Nice to see um, you. Thank you so much. It's good to see you. I am uh, I was intending to uh, participate much more, but... Uh, I respect my limits. Oh God, what is that? My limits? Yeah, what's respecting your limits? What I, I the concept that's new to me. What what <laughs> what is that? How does one what? You know, um, one thing that cancer teaches you is acceptance. Mm. So uh, certainly uh, that uh, um, is something I need to learn more of, but uh, I I you know we all we all are where we are. And and there we are. There we are. Wherever we go. Morning. There we are. Here we are. Exactly. Be here now. Be there then, I really believe. Yeah. <laughs> be where why? <laughs> that could be our new motto. Be where why. Be where why. Be where why not. Oh, I, I was gonna tell a joke about time travel, but you guys didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. God, how have I never heard that one before? <laughs> and I've even posted it in, in, in a couple of places. Darn it. You know what? Havesheimers. It's like all the jokes are new again. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> we don't serve your kind in here. A tachyon walks into a bar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, hey, everybody. Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you might be. Yeah, exactly. And wherever you are, there you are. Um, I've been here before. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, so, uh, partly, uh, maybe I'll I'll check in early in the in this round as well, as we go. Uh, hey, Klaus. Hey, Charlotte. Hey, Stacy. Um, Michael. Uh, Kenneth, welcome to the call. Glad to have you here. Um, Hi. And why don't we go into a bit of a check-in round and, and let me start a little bit with a, a bit of a check-in, which is um, OGM is slowly making its way into becoming more of an organization, which has been a, uh, an exciting and occasionally bumpy path and we're getting places. And one of the things that, that um, will happen or is happening is that we would love to bring more people sort of into the organization. And at this point, Partly that means somebody who loves like uh, project management, getting things done, uh, minding where our documents are, helping us see our way from meeting to meeting kind of thing. So if you know anybody or if you yourself are interested uh, in those kinds of things, uh, let us know. We are, um, we are to say like Pete has been, Pete Kaminsky who is inventing uh, massive wiki, massive everything, it has also sort of functionally made himself kind of the, the secretary and project manager for the middle of this. <clears throat> and has a, a bunch of things that he needs to, to do in life. So we're kind of in some sense trying to uh, enhance that function and take it off of, uh, off of his shoulders. Um, so if you know of anybody, well, let us know. Um, in the spirit of OGM, what we do is we just go around and check in and see what anybody's doing that's OGM-E. Uh, I kind of just go through the list. We don't always make it through everybody, but this is not a big group right now, so we probably will. Uh, so let me just start with, um, Gil, is your video off because you are in a, in a, at a moment where it would not be convenient to, to jump in? Uh, yep. Okay, good. Then I'll pass and I'll uh, come back to you. Uh, so let's go um, uh, Stacy, Klaus, Ken. And we're chatting on Mattermost, uh, a link that I will put uh, in the Zoom chat here. Uh, if you're not on Mattermost, go, go click on it and, it'll, and ask for a a login and that'll bring you back. But we're trying to keep a persistent chat between sessions. Sorry to interrupt you, Stacey. 
It's okay. Um, well, first, I just want to ask you real quickly, what exactly would that entail? What are you looking for the person to do? Um, it means, um, well, for a moment, it's a volunteer position. One of the things we're doing is we're busy uh, creating a reservoir that is under, uh, that is a fiscally sponsored entity under Lionsburg's charity organization. So it'd become its own charity under theirs. And then mm -hmm. it, we can apply for grants and things like that. So uh, part of it is we're, we're organizing ourselves to start taking grants so that we can have things like OGM fellowships, because a bunch of people who were in here um, doing really interesting things and sweating blood and building pieces of what are eventually sort of an OGM environment are making no money from it and could use some support. So we're trying to get there. So I think my question is, what's the skill set you're looking for? Exactly. So the skills I'm looking for is actually attending meetings, um, listening to what's going on and organizing it into uh, agendas and to-do lists and sort of project management-y, uh, okay, last time we said we we're going to do this, how'd it go, uh, keeping notes, all that kind of thing. And then um, we're using Massive Wiki right now as our note-taking structure, which is a bit geeky because you, the documents are all on GitHub and you have to know how to push things to GitHub and how to use a, a markdown editor like Obsidian or HackMD, all of which might be gibberish at this point, but mo most, most of us are moderately fluent in it. Haven't, I don't know that I have the confidence that I could easily like use all those things and fling them around and know that I haven't like written over the old copy or done something stupid. Um, I've heard of Felix Kramer, but don't know him, uh, don't know him well, Gil. Um, and so we're also at the cusp of trying to figure out some of the tools issues between uh, staying on Massive Wiki to do all that, moving on into Notion, which is what uh, Lionsburg is using pretty heavily at this point, it seems, uh, or uh, falling back on Google Docs or something else. And uh, we'll, we'll sort of see because, because a piece of Open Global Minds exploration is this tools mix. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we how do we save and link up the things that we're that we know and that we're doing, um, and so 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 it's it's kind of project management management -y and administrative and that the particular role we're looking for. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, I'm sorry, Stacey. I had to explain more of the background so that so that whoever. No, I'm glad. <laughs> yeah, whoever it is that's interested would know the kind of the context. Being recorded. Walking, yeah. <laughs> the context they're walking into. Exactly. Go ahead, Gil. Yeah, Stacey, before you go on, um, uh, Felix um, uh, is putting together something called Active Allies, which is trying to marry, uh, um, for want of a better word, more uh, o older folks with younger folks, intergenerational partnerships of mentorship, internship, collaboration. And it might be, and he's focusing primarily on climate, but it might be worth having a chat with him about exactly this. That's really interesting. That's super interesting. Uh, was he part of the CalCars initiative? Back the who initiated CalCars, which was the drive to get uh, plug-in hybrid vehicles adopted by Toyota and others and into the market. So he did okay. that. Okay. So very, I have him, I have him in my brain. Entrepreneurial climate things. And um, we've wor I've, I've, I've got somebody working with me now that came through him um, on my Critical Path Academy work. And so he might be, a, 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 he might be a, an ally in getting those people that you're looking for. Sounds great. Uh, and I have him in my brain under that and nothing else. Okay. Um, so I thank you for, for the refresh. I'll, I'll, I'll send you uh, contact info for him. I would love that. Thank you. So now let's go back to Stacy, Klaus, and Kim. Okay. So um, I have nothing really to share other than my, you know, recently I've been asked to engage in some conversations regarding what's going on in Israel. And I've said for the past few years, that is the one conversation that I'm not comfortable with at all. Um, and I've been thinking like I want to be comfortable with it. Part of the problem is I don't know enough about it. And any source that I go to is usually a biased source. <clears throat> so I was just curious, you know, if anybody had any thoughts about that, and um, that's it. That's what's on my mind. So, Stacy, that's a lovely um, question because I, I share your hesitation, trepidation, uh, whatever hesitancy about the topic. I have a bunch of friends who are who are deeply on one side, a bunch of friends who are deeply on the other side, and I, I sometimes fear to tread, and I feel. Um, uninformed because there's so much going, part, partly also because there's simply so much going on and there's so much history woven into this. Um, I'd love to know if anybody on the call um, has good advice here. Gil, go ahead. 
Uh, I don't know if I have good advice, but I have thoughts. Uh, I'm 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 deeply, <laughs> I'm deeply in both sides, um, and um, and I hunger for thoughtful, not balanced, but thoughtful, multi-perspectival conversations about this. And I find and it's, I find it very hard to find. Um, and um, you know, Ken, you've seen my stuff on on Facebook. I don't know what your assessment of it is, but I've tried to be. Um, thoughtful and nuanced and historically grounded and offering contrary perspectives. My post stuff that I don't necessarily agree with and that I do agree with to try to try to broaden and round out um, the conversation. And it's pretty difficult. Uh, I'm, I'm in a open conversation with somebody now. I did actually intentionally didn't respond for a day. I'm going to do that after this call where um, how to say this. Um, well, let me give the specific example. Uh, you know, a lot of people are seeing this current conflict as having begun two weeks ago or begun 10 years ago or 15 years ago or 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I posted a list of the events of the last hundred. And somebody said, well, that's really biased. Okay, I said, well, okay, if you think it's biased, um, you know, say why. If, there's th if you think it's biased because it's missing important things, please add them mm -hmm. uh, so we can have a more complete history. And then I got from a couple of people, you know, sort of, you know, chastised for, well, for being biased myself, um, for shutting down the conversation. Um, people, re some people responded to the history by saying, yeah, but Israel's doing horrible things. I said, great. Yeah, that's true. Um, there's other threads about that. Talk about that in another thread. This thread is about the history. And so I got, you know, got yelled at for that. So it's very challenging, I find. Um, to have that certainly Facebook is, is a difficult venue for it. Uh, there are bunches of Israelis and Palestinians working together to try to break out of this thing, and that's an interesting conversation. That you know, people have tried in various forms. John Blades' living rooms dialogue here in the states. John Marks uh, at Search for Common Ground, which actually that might be a place to check out, Stacy, because um, they've gone into conflict zones over the past you know, 30, 40 years. You know, Israel, Palestine, Northern Ireland, places like that, to try to bring people together to have face-to-face -face exploratory conversations with each other. Uh, so that's an initiative that's been going on in the Middle East for many decades. We had uh, old friends who were gosh, I guess back as early as the 1960s, um, having secret dinners at their home uh, in Israel that, you know, just like you know, couldn't be had, couldn't be acknowledged, but were had. And there were people who on both sides who wanted to do that. Um, there's a thought that this blitz through and, um, oh gosh, sorry, I lost it. That's okay, Gil, that was- that anyhow, anyhow, it's, it's, it's rough. And, yeah. it's, uh, and it's deeply, deeply tangled. I guess that's one of the things about it for people who are looking at both sides. It is so bound up in lived experience and socialized experience and actual history going back for, you know, for a fair piece that it's not something we can say, well, in this moment, this is what should happen. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of discussion without context. I guess Here's, you, where I'd sum it up. Years ago, there was a project, one of many projects trying to bridge Israeli and Palestinian points of view that sent a bunch of Israeli and Palestinian youths to a favela in Brazil. Mm. I think it was Brazil, might've been South Africa, a township or something like that, where they had to work together. Mm. And they became friends over the course of working together to fix something that was, that was broken in all of their eyes. Uh, and that did some help, right? But, but it seems like all those patches end up feeling temporary and so forth. But it feels like, and, and I'll just say the parallels right now to the American uh, political situation are remarkable because, because the well is very poisoned in America for trying to have discourse about a lot of these issues. Um, and it feels to me like the most important thing that OGM might be able to do in the near term is create fora or even just process or even pointing to best practices for how to handle these kinds of situations and where to look. And, and Gilly just mentioned Search for Common Ground. Yeah. Like just knowing what initiative to go look into and start participating in is a big help. Sure, that's the easiest place to start is pointing to resources and initiatives that are already underway is very different level of lift than trying to create one. 
Uh, so that's something we can do immediately. And I would exactly do that. Uh, you mentioned the poisoned well. I mean, one of the things that concerns me deeply about this situation is how uh, is the continuing poisoning of the well in Israel, um, which is not separate from the poisoning in the United States because Trump and Netanyahu and those guys play together. Right. Um, and so, you know, you know uh, sacrificing the social fabric on the altar of political expediency is something that's happening in both those countries. I mean, Hamas has been Hamas forever, so that's not the new deal there. Uh, but Israel has, as, as I read it, I haven't been there in a long time, it has deeply, deeply soured. Um, and, um, and um, you know, I guess in theory, there's more possibility there than with Hamas because it's, you know, it's still a democracy. Yeah. So far. Um, so there's, you know, in theory, there's possibility there, but that's, that's, that's for me, the point of despair right now. It's not so much the immediate bombs and rockets being thrown back, but what's happened to Israeli society in the last, um, and, and culture and norms in the last 30 years. Yeah. Klaus, did you want to jump in? Yeah. My daughter married a young man from Tel Aviv uh, a few years back. You now they have two little children now, three and one and uh, three and two and one on the way, third child. And uh, she really is in this, uh, she fell into this hole of uh, publishing on Facebook some of these uh, messaging that comes through apparently to the Israeli population via Twitter and others. And they're superbly one-sided and, and superbly negative uh, messages, which I wish she wouldn't uh, publish there because <clears throat> most of our friends are rather on the liberal side. Yeah. And so is, uh, I mean, so her, she, she, is, she went to college in, in Orange County in Hong Kong and in Germany. And so she has friends everywhere, but most of her friends are really, who are not Jewish are really not, uh, um, not uh, so so one-sided and it's a really difficult thing so she stopped talking with my wife which is just breaking my wife's heart mm -hmm. um, and and so it's uh, and without us having said anything you know, the only thing that i have published on uh, to her is uh, a little photo album with uh, pictures uh, family pictures and, and situations and with the title of the only thing that really matters is friends and family. You know? But it's really horrible um, how, the, uh, how they're pumping the, uh, the opinions there. I mean, this is as bad as it is here, you know, in, in, uh, in radicalizing the uh, people, people's opinions, really. There's like no room for any kind of dialogue or compromise. Uh, yeah. So this is really... Uh, you know, and it's, it totally coincided with Netanyahu losing his uh, uh, government, uh, having to reposition this. So it's, it's, a, it's just a horrible thing. And so we, we are like, yeah, we can't really say anything. Anymore. Yeah, yeah there's, a, there's a body of opinion that says that uh, the reason that Netanyahu launched this particular action at this particular time um, was because of the difficulties in forming a government. And this is a complete distraction from that story. It sort of wagged the dog? It sort of wagged the dog. And, you know, it, the, the extremism, of course, cuts both ways. I don't know if people saw the news yesterday, but there was an incident in LA um, where Palestinian youth attacked people dining in an outside restaurant asking, you know, are you Jewish and beat, beat some folks up. So that, they didn't ask, are you a supporter of Israel and Netanyahu? They said, are you Jewish? So this is, you know, that's the scary <clears throat> downside of this. Karen Armstrong, the, the, the brilliant lapsed Catholic nun, has a book called The Battle for God, um, in which she asserts that the, that the, the fundamentalist extremists of, of each of the Abrahamic religions have more in common with each other than with their co-religionists. Yeah, it's it's yeah. just yeah, it is it is that it's a really it's a really upsetting insight, but it rings very true for me. But all of them are being agitated for political purposes in each scenario, you know, and that that is really and then, but for us to not be able to get a handle on that uh, and, uh, and is 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 really uh, scary. You know? mm -hmm. um, Mark, did you want to read the passage from Haaretz Haaretz that you found that you mentioned in the chat? 
if you're still there. Yes, I am still here. Although. Excellent. <laughs> Good, thanks. Um, well, it, it's, uh, it's not just one um, article. It's, uh, there are many, and I, I like I like arrets. Um, when, when I there's things I don't understand, it's uh, one source that I go to. Um, but there have been for the last four years looking at Israeli societies as a body that's uh, moving dramatically to the right. As is, is anyone um, in Sebastopol lives in Sebastopol or around Sebastopol? There is a very interesting uh, Israeli community there. Very lefty people that left Israel, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. And uh, very critical uh, of Israel, of what they see when they come back there. They, most of them say that they don't recognize it. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, quite, it's quite telling how uh, some of them are former um, IDF officers, long-term officers, careerists. IDF and, is the and even de defense um, forces. Very, of course, very, very defensive. So there is, there is even there, and even in Europe, actually, uh, a, 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 a division of Israeli society that, that and Jewish, Jewish societies that we, did, we, we didn't think we will see again. Thinking of after the uh, the Shoah, it's it's really particular to see that division uh, and, when it shouldn't be. Yeah, the the, the larger <clears throat> one of the larger frames here is just how do you resolve human conflicts? Mm -hmm. How do you resolve long-standing bias, long-standing conflict? Uh, did truth and reconciliation work in South Africa, for example? And we had, I had a call two years ago, maybe longer, with a fellow. Uh, a white fellow in South Africa who said, frankly, apartheid's still on the ground. I don't know that truth and reconciliation fixed anything, um, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so I think the, our quest for peacemaking is, is huge and important. And uh, I, if anybody has glimpses of, of bigger hope, uh, please say so. Ken, did you want to jump in? Yes and no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um... I have a, a, one of my closest friends is 81 years old and was sort of the, one of the founding citizens of Israel. He went there when he was, was 17 years old and you know, he shows up in several books and he's a heavy duty Zionist. And I had lunch with him yesterday and he actually said something that really surprised me. He says, my heart is in with both the Palestinians and the Israelis, which gave me some hope because this is a guy who, you know, he's kind of constantly saying, you know, how the, the, the Palestinians and, and the Arabs hate the Jews and, it's, he's been sending out stuff about how they're, um, they hide behind children and you know they target civilians. And I'm like, well, we can go back to the Peloponnesian Wars with the salting of the earth afterwards. I mean, civilians have been targets in wars for a very long time. So that is not to me an argument about how bad those people are because every single country that I can think of you know, who's been involved in a war sooner or later targets civilians. So we've got to move that from the table. <laughs> the awesome. thing I'm interested in is um, there's a process called dynamic dialogue. And in dynamic dialogue, you have a group of people who represent the uh, really sticky points that are, that are showing up. So maybe in a group of 30 or 40 people, you choose a half dozen, maybe, maybe eight. And you give each of them a line. So, you know, um, one of the lines is, we just want to live in peace, but if you threaten us, we will kill you. You know, we're exterminate. We're, we're going to fight back. And, and so everybody just says their line a couple of times to kind of get in their body. And then they start to speak their lines one at a time and going around in a circle. And you just watch, the people are watching, you know, we're just observing. And then you give people permission to start to move as they speak their lines. Mm -hmm. And um, anyone in the, in the observing group can say, stop. And everybody just stops, say, what's going on? And you look at body posture, you look at, at relation, spatial relationships. And after a while, you start to allow them to say things that, that keep them in character rather than just the line they've been giving, but that are in character. And you can see people start to shift and turn. So it, it frees up the logjam around the ideological stance where they take the next logical step. 
it's a fascinating process. I've only done it a couple of times. Um, it, it's very, very useful in helping people to see the unconscious dynamics that are going on. And by people physically moving in the room, I, I was doing this with one group around, um, uh, what they call it, Plan Bay Area, which is this thing where people are saying the UN is trying to take over you know, our, our rights. And um, at one point, this woman was, was pointing her finger at three people and, and saying her line and all three simultaneously just turned their back on her. And we said, wait, what happened there, right? And they said, that energy was just so disgusting. We didn't want to deal with it. And when we start to recognize that, it's like we, as an observing group, recognize that these kinds of things are so disgusting. We want to deal with them. And that allows us the space to say, well, let's change the conversation. And the last thing I'll say is, you know, he asked me what I thought the solution was. And I said, get rid of all the leaders and put grandmothers in charge. <laughs> Because they certainly couldn't fuck it up any worse than it's already fucked up, you know. To me, war is the failure of leadership at the highest level. And if we had grandmothers who were in charge of things, I think things would really be very, very different. And he's like, well, you'll never get that to happen. I'm like, well, maybe, maybe not. But unless you propose the idea, um, you know, I've had this idea for a very long time of, of an army of elders, you know. What happens is when there's a hot spot, we send in young men under 25 whose frontal cortexes aren't fully developed. We um, hype them all up with all kinds of, of jingoistic slogans. We arm them heavily and say, go out there and sell, sell the problem. But if we sent people in their 70s, grandmothers and grandfathers with blankets and soup and said, you look cold, have a blanket. You look hungry, have some soup. Tell me what's going on. How did this start? What's your role in this? Who, who's the enemy here? And just began to listen and feed people and, and, and get, keep them warm and give them, a, you know, some, some respite. I think we'd make a long, uh, a lot of inroads into solving some of these problems. You know, there's people out there who are suffering tremendously with, with lack of everything you can think of. And there's people out there who have so much that they couldn't spend what they have in a billion lifetimes. And we somehow think that that's okay. Mm -hmm. these, yeah. are not, these are not unrelated. You know, billionaires create a lot of this. I don't want to, let me say, a system that creates billionaires creates a lot of the problems that we're seeing. So we've got large system dynamics that need to be addressed. They have to start, they have to be addressed at all levels, you know, from the level of the individual all the way up to the level of, of the system. And the leverage points are difficult to see, but dynamic dialogue is one way to start to reveal some of those levers and to help to shift the, the, the uh, perspectives. So just to pick up one thread from what you said, um, and this is gonna sound like a weird path into it, but I think you'll see the connection. <clears throat> one of the big questions in the back of my head is given the crap that social media is in right now and how you know the, the, whole, the deep hole that Facebook seems to have dug for civilization is what if Facebook were designed for citizens, not consumers? How would the affordances be different? How would identity be handled differently? How would information be handled differently? Certainly you wouldn't be selling off anybody's information. There might be a fee for, who knows, but how would you do it differently? But wouldn't it be cool if the interface for Facebook then prompted you and said, hey, it seems like this community could use a process. Here's three, one of them is dynamic dialogue. And what if the interface could then find somebody who could guide them through it and connect them to the group or <laughs> coach, coach them through how to do dynamic dialogue themselves or whatever, and then, debrief them after the process and feed that back into the public sphere in a way that works, right? So that other communities could be like, hey, I'll have what they're having, right? And then, and then maybe good behaviors and positive processes would trickle their way across community to community in some organic fashion. And it doesn't have to be the same process and you can adapt it and so on and so forth. But, but we need a way to sort of undermine the top-down narratives of spin and control that have seized the scripts that are running in our heads and taken over our ability to just sit down with other people as humans. And if this, and if this form of dialogue lets us wake up a little bit out of that reverie and see one another as humans again and come back into a trusting dialogue, that's awesome. And it's kind of priceless. And, and by the way, it's cost-free. I mean, at most what this should cost is, is fee, fair, fair make a living wages paid to facilitators, coaches, other people who know how to hold these spaces and do this with people, right? So, um, Doug, go I'll ahead. Just one second, and I'll, I'll yield to Doug. Um, 
I've been listening to Celeste Headley, who is an NPR reporter who has a wonderful talk at Google about how to have better conversations. And she said, you know, it's really important that we learn how to have conversations because the last time Americans were this divided, we were killing each other. It was this little war. And um, small talk is really important. You know, people think, oh, small talk is nothing. But small talk is, is the glue that holds society together. And in the last 20 years, as screen time has gone up, empathy has, has plummeted. So we need a design in social media that fosters empathy rather than, than indifference and rather than contempt. Because I think we've got a lot of platforms that are fostering contempt. I see it all the time on Facebook and Twitter. And it's like, I would never say things to people in real life that I see people say on social media. I just wouldn't do that if they were in the same room. It's like, that would be horrible, you know? So if we can start to design for empathy, um, I think that would also be a really huge step. Sorry, Doug, go ahead. Go ahead, Doug. Yeah, um, so much of the discussion about Israel and the Middle East is based on the idea that if we could change attitudes and thoughts, we'd make a big difference. I tend to disagree with that. Uh, I'm, a, I'm not normally a Marxist, but I think a material uh, analysis of the Middle East, that is where are the economic opportunities, how are they moving, and how is that affecting uh, uh, people's underlying attitudes? It's as though the Middle East is really a game of, of musical chairs and everybody is afraid of losing out. Made complicated by the fact that climate change is probably going to make a lot of the Middle East unlivable. And people are kind of anticipating that in their, uh, the energy that's going into these dialogues. But I just don't think the dialogues are going to make any difference. It's the material conditions that are important. And a piece of what happens is if we push on many different directions at once and they're mutually reinforcing, we might actually crack the code too. Because um, I, I think that the dialogue, for, for, uh, there's a story about Black October, the PLOs, Black September, I think, sorry, not, sorry to insult October. Uh, there was a, a terrorist organization that the PLO started years ago that pulled off the Munich uh, attack and you know, killed the athletes the, at the Munich Olympics in 72. And that got Yasser Arafat a seat at the table. He started getting invited to talks and taking seriously as an organization. So then he needed to, um, make sure that, that like they stopped doing a lot of terrorist things, but they had 300 finely trained terrorists who were like eager to go do some more damage. And so what they did was they put a call out across the Arab Crescent and they said, the chairman needs your help. Young, young ladies of the Arab Crescent, the chairman needs your help. And they basically married off the 300 terrorists. They, they gave them a bonus if they married, they would give them a flat and a TV. If, and if they had a kid, they'd get another bonus or whatever. And they basically, successfully melted a terrorist organization by giving them lives, by giving them the ability to have you know, a normal reality. Right. Um, and I may, be, I may be idealizing, and there's, a, there's an Atlantic article that I learned this from that I'll find and post to the, to the chat. But so I'm really torn because a huge piece of this is about people otherizing others and fearing them so much that they'll do anything. And that's not necessarily resolved with economic well-being. You know, like, if I'm doing better, I still may hate those people over there. It's just that I'm a little, a little comfier now. Um, so I, I have a feeling that, that like all fronts, multiple fronts at once is some way to get through this. Uh, any, other, any other thoughts on this particular theme? And then we'll go back to a, a check-in round. Stacy, thank you for opening Pandora's box in that nice way. Jerry, I had not heard that um, story about the melting of the 300 terrorists. It's a remarkable story. Yeah. Um, you know, it's important because the, 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 you know, the teenage and young adult male cohort is the most dangerous cohort in the world. Mm -hmm. Especially unemployed and angry. And that's what I was gonna add, unemployed, angry, and hopeless, no prospects. So yeah. there's the combination, there's, there's, where, there's where Ken's story and Doug's story meet each other. Um, yeah, people, go ahead. People, uh, um, People may know that Shimon Peres, former prime minister of Israel, was focused on exactly what Doug was talking about. You know, trying to build a co-prosperity sphere uh, between between the 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 both the Israeli and Palestinian populations and Israel and the West Bank and Jordan to create economic development together. It was a very very you know grounded and strategically thought through initiative that seemed to have some promise. I don't know the exact history of it, but I think it was probably 
uh, died around the time that Rabin was murdered, which of course is where the whole game in Israel starts to spin seriously out of control. Yeah. Um, Ken, did you want to jump in further on yeah. this? Yeah, go ahead. Um, 25 years or so, 27 years ago, I think it was, I went to a, a multicultural men's retreat led by um, Michael Mead and uh, Jack Cornfield and a few other uh, folks. And uh, it was terrifying. Um, I, I'd never been so scared in my life. Um, there were 110 men. There were 40 African-Americans, 40 Latinos, 30 Anglos, and one Asian man. Um, and there were a lot of angry youth there. And um, we opened up and they said, there's two rules. Rule number one is conflict hour. We don't put conflict off. When conflict arises, we deal with it in the moment. Can we all get agreement on that? Yes, everybody's like totally down with that. Rule number two, we don't resort to violence when dealing with rule number one. Can we agree with that? No. <laughs> now, we knew there were at least three guns on the property, which meant oh. that there were three people who said, if I get pissed at you, I reserve the right to shoot you dead, mm. which is why I was terrified for three days. <laughs> wow. So I just, I think that that one rule among civil, quote, civilized nations of, you know, we will deal with conflict when it arises and we agree not to kill each other in the face of conflict, which of course goes against the entire military industrial congressional university complex, right? Um, but if we could simply adopt the rule of, yes, I see that you have a very different way of living than I do and you have different values and mores, um, I am not gonna, I'm not gonna kill you over that disagreement. You know, I'll, we'll, we'll sit in difficult conversations as long as it takes to work through and get to an, a, an end. So yeah, that is what the UN is supposed to be. We um, have it. But we've reserved the right with our military might to say we will kill anybody who gets in our way. And that is so anti-democratic. It's so not what this country was founded on. Um, and it is, it's one of those stances when you arm the whole world that leads to the kinds of problems we're having. Mm -hmm. Ken, did anybody kill each other at that retreat? No, after three days of, um, after three days of, of people, of the, the, the facilitators talking with the, the guys who had the guns, they decided to leave. And I have no idea what prompted me to do this incredibly stupid thing, but I went over to their cars, they were driving out and I stopped them and I said, I just wanna say, I know you come from a different world than the one I live in, and I came here in the hopes that we could actually get to know each other and find a way to be together in peace. I understand you can't be here, but I just want to wish you that you stay safe as wherever you go. And they just kind of grunted at me and drove off. But I felt this need to say that. I, I, you know, I was like, I don't even know where that came from. But it was actually, I, I didn't know where it came from. It came from the reason I went to this retreat. I knew it was going to be hairy. I knew it was going to be hard. But I really wanted to, to get down to the, you know, to the nitty gritty of life and like i have to live in this world with people who do not like me and they as jerry's pointed out there's this man who who's got all these black men with ku klux klan robes in his garage because he's like how can you hate me if you don't know me i wanted these guys to know me that that you know if they're going to hate me at least know me and know why you're hating me as opposed to just because i'm a white guy thank you um let's go back to our check-in round uh, we have Klaus, Ken, Charlotte. Okay. Yeah, switching over to agriculture and climate change and food security, food supply. And just one more comment to what Doug was saying. You know, the Middle East is running dry and Israel has the capacity to export agricultural technology that is unparalleled in the world, but instead exports weaponry and you know, advises Saudi Arabia on the latest uh, espionage technology and so on. So that's really sad to see. But anyway, we, uh, um, we were able to, to do our webinar a couple of days ago on just putting in the uh, website again with business climate leaders. And we ended up with um, 954 people signing up. Over 500 came from LinkedIn. So it was a was a very professional group. Um, my partner here, business climate leaders, is is divided into sectors of the economy. And the guy who partnered with me was a CEO of a biofuel company. He's a chemical engineer by background. 
and he invited you know, a lot of chemical engineers um, uh, into into the discussion. And we had a surprising number of people from the finance sector also uh, joining us. Um, we had uh, 445 people show up. That's a 47 percent. Uh, show rate, which is really amazing. And there's people from all over the world. We had people from Brazil, from Africa, I mean, South America, Africa, Europe, uh, dialing in on it. Um, and the, the, um, the discussion was really focused on, uh, on using agriculture and land use um, uh, management to regenerate the soil and fill the soil with carbon, pull carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, so we have we we got tremendous feedback, and we are now starting to work on a second webinar focused on biofuels because that is uh, um, a really hot topic that that uh, not not much focus has been on there, um, and there's there's uh, a lot of damage being done in biofuel planning. So now, but we have the chemical sector on board now, which is which is you know, wonderful. Um, for the OGM side of things, I finally have some time to focus uh, again on uh, the plans that we that we have um, with Jordan. I have a meeting with Jordan on Monday, a work session to uh, set up a business plan, you know, to, to put some structure around where we want to take this. Uh, but you know, for, for those who haven't listened to this so far, we, we have... Um, we have take, made contact with the Global Regeneration Collab, which uh, with David Witzel, who is also you know, a friend of Jerry's, um, they have developed a wonderful platform that we could use you know, to, uh, to um, attract uh, people and to assist groups of people who are working on community food systems development. And we wanted to, to uh, uh, find a niche, you know, where the, the the gap that I that I see in the market is really to bring small scale uh, 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 community systems uh, into the wholesale market, because the, uh, the the in the United States at least the aggregation capacity and the brokerage function has basically been taken out completely, and uh, the large large companies have pulled all of that inside. Uh, and moved into a form of contract farming that shuts out the small farmer. So there is, uh, I mean, right now the USDA uh, has a $96 million fund chasing investment opportunities. They can't, they can't really even find uh, uh, places to invest where there is enough competency, you know, where you, where you feel that this group uh, of, of individuals from within the community has the competency to, to use that money uh, and, and, uh, and turn it into, into uh, uh, productive uses. So that's, you know, the, 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 there is enormous energy. I mean, there, there, are, um, there are literally literally billions of dollars ready, ready to be invested in that sector, um, but uh, there is no clear strategy on how to do it. Um, there is one point that lead, would lead to further centralization uh, when when uh, you look at where the the multinational companies are going, um, and then there is one movement that says we need to decentralize the entire supply chain in order to empower the farmer, you know, to to use regional um, uh, seeds and crop types and so on in order to deal with local soils. You know, soils are uniquely regional. They are. First of all, soils themselves are different by region, then you have climate differences and water accessibility and socioeconomics that are related to this. So it's an exciting project. Yeah, it's very ambitious. <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll uh, see where it goes. Now, Ken and I uh, uh, are on a course at the Institute for Evolutionary Leadership. And uh, this week is a couple of young men from Uganda uh, working on a local food system. So it's just like a really fitting discussion to have We're meeting with them tomorrow to, uh, to give them feedback on what the group was thinking about their, uh, their presentation and their efforts there. So a lot of happening in that space. Um, and uh, 
yeah, it's hard to retire at the same time. So <laughs> you know, of uh, balancing this. Yeah, that's it. Oh, thank you. I just pointed to the uh, channel we have in Mattermost for this theme. If, if people want to participate, learn more, um, do things like that. Uh, and I, I, I'm excited that it's, this is forming up as something that can sort of stand up and be an entity. That sounds really, really awesome. Uh, so thank you. Um, let's go Charlotte, Ken, Michael. You are still muted. You're hunting for that mute button. You found it. Hunting. I have three screens. So, I, you know, I've, I brought this on myself. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I just had a periodic check in this morning and uh, we're going forward on the version four and of the handbook and our uh, course. We have another session at noon today, second session. And um, as far as the podcast, this discussion was really useful and helpful because difficult conversations is our subject for our um, June podcast. And I might be contacting some of you to see if you'd like to come on and talk about it. It's, um, you know, I don't know. It's, it's a, I think a critical topic for our times, but that's about it. Got out rowing this morning, set my day straight. Um, that's great. Love that. Uh, I think each of us has our way of, of setting our day straight. I used to work <laughs> for Esther Dyson, who um, famously loved to swim first thing. And, you know, if I got to work at 7 a.m. On, on Fifth Avenue in New York, she would already have gone all the way down. Her favorite pool in Manhattan was way down south. I don't remember which, what pool, but um, she lived like uh, near 14th. She would have some way down, swum at 6 or something like that, or, or earlier, like 530 come back mm -hmm. right off and, and she'd be at work always before me. Like That almost, sounds like her, yeah. Almost always. But uh, yeah, but but for her, and, and in, imagine in the days before internet, when she's busy traveling to places in the former Soviet Union, um, her assistant's main, like, main important job was to guarantee access to a pool every morning, which sometimes <laughs> meant bribing a guard uh, sometimes meant like all kinds of other funny things. I, I would love to see just the just April's pool memoirs. I think that'd be a, a fun thing. Yeah, it's it's fun because um, yeah, I got there about six thirty. There was there were people coming in at six thirty who had been out at five, yeah. and they see like that's the sunrise I see when I start when I get there early enough. That's but it's just like it's just really, you know, it just puts everything in perspective. <laughs> I love it. And also love that Pyragogy and Liberating Structures and a bunch of other things that are sort of sister organizations are all focused on how do we bridge this divide? How do we how do yeah. we have difficult conversations and get somewhere? Mm -hmm. What are the tools mm -hmm. to make that work better? Yeah. Um, how do we how do we make that actually function? Yeah, I think Judith is going to be one of our guests on that. Um, and then some folks yeah. from, from uh, Washington State that I know um, close to Idaho. <laughs> Sounds great. Yeah. Um, let's go Ken, Michael, Lauren. And if, if Lauren can talk while she's on the hoof. I'll keep this short since I've already spoken quite a bit today. Um, along fitting into the topic of the day, I've actually been paid recently to lead a couple of difficult conversations for a client. Um, I had 30 people on a Zoom call where there's a tremendous amount of um, challenging emotion in the room. And I had 15 minutes to frame it up and get them, you know, the guy's like, the, the CEO is like, you don't have time to do this body shit. You know, we, we don't have time for that. We got to talk. I'm like, you need to trust me that I need to do the body shit. <laughs> um, so I did my shortest ever somatic practice uh, for folks and, and they got it. They, they really, they were very appreciative. Um, and uh, I've been hanging out with Lauren and Charles uh, and Vincent uh, and Judith over in the Kiko lab. Um, and it's been really wonderful to see what's going on there. I'm just so excited for um, what's happening around our, our experiments in collective intelligence. And um, uh, I finally, uh, because of this last uh, difficult conversation with this client, decided I'd, I'd write a blog post on how to have a conversation with complaints because I think a lot of people don't understand 
that there are times when it's necessary to complain and there's ways to do that that are effective. So I put a link in the Mattermost chat if you want to check it out. I'd love any feedback you have. Um, and that was like sort of a, my first post that fully vaxxed post emerging from pandemic move professional move in the world like i'm getting back into the swing of things after this long you know period of being sort of locked down so happy to be back very nice to have you here thank you mike did you want to jump in okay you raised your hand somehow uh so i was just responding to that I oh, think that's, any that's for oh, check-in oh, later mike. Oh, okay. It was just an involuntary gesture then. Oh, let's check in later. Okay, good. I'll, I'll make sure you're in the queue. Um, cool. So let's go, uh, Michael, Lauren, and Pete. Um, hello, everyone. Yes. Um, check, check. Really Is this on? Oh, can you not hear me? We hear you fine. Okay. Yeah, sorry. That was just me making fun. Okay. Um, <clears throat> um, thanks. For the for the good conversation about a difficult conversation, and uh, you know, I <clears throat> I don't have much to add, just uh, a lot to absorb there. Um, and uh, um, on a, on a much much um, smaller scale, um, I've been in some groups um, dealing with the difficult conversations around interests and overlap. Um, uh, with the folks at um, in, in various co-op uh, organizations and, and co-op promotional entities um, like Zebras Unite and, uh, and, and some of the other, other groups that are trying to foster more um, platform cooperatives, et cetera, and um, figuring out structures uh, for which Uh, organizations of different types can throw in together and be interoperative, be um, conversant. You know, it's interesting. Um, I think it was um, Klaus was mentioning something about, actually, I'm not sure who it was, uh, was mentioning something about a group um, that had set up a discussion platform that was really great. And, um, and there are a lot of uh, a lot of siloed areas of intelligence that are really great for the fact that they're as siloed as they are. I mean, just like we are, you know, you're talking with people who are coming from the same place you are and you're not dealing with public space. Um, but at the same time, the public space wants access to that kind of knowledge and, and sober wisdom on a subject that isn't a sound bite or an incendiary tweet. Um, so you want that to be able to filter out and you want them to, there to be some lingua franca, um, just, you know, um, in terms of protocols and languages and, and uh, just simplicity of, of transmission and sharing. Um, and these co-op groups are, 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 really, really interesting and really smart. And I occur, I don't know if anybody's involved in the Zebras Unite group, but it's, uh, it's really a good bunch of people. And I encourage you to get involved. I encourage a couple of them to come join us, which they, they haven't today. Um, um, anyway, that's, that's what's on my mind a lot um, is having those difficult conversations around structure and, and competition and cooperation, um, which is, I feel like it's usually what's on my mind when I come to these, these sessions. So uh, yeah, that's it from me. Um, thanks, Mike, Michael. Um, so a couple things. One, Mara Zapeda, who is one of the three, found, three four founders of Zebras Unite, uh, is a dear friend and has just recently moved away from Portland. But uh, the founders, many of them were here in Portland. Uh, and we're, I, I spoke at the first, uh, they had a, a Dazzle Con two years ago which was their first get together. So they gave me 15 minutes to show my brain related to Zebras Unite kinds of topics, which was really fun. Um, but, it, but it's a great group, really interesting, heavily skewed towards sort of creative finance, really, like, like what's, what's the, what are the financial models that live here? Uh, second thing, uh, Mark Carranza, um, we were having a chat on Mattermost, which is answering some of your questions. And I think you're on Mattermost because I think you posted one of your lists 
from your database on Mattermost. So you'll, if you'll see, I posted Zebras Unite and all that over there. If you'll take your chat there, you can, jo you can join up. And then Rob is asking, what is that list? So uh, I will pass the floor to you shortly so you can explain, I think, uh, what you've done and, and, and how, that, how that works. So that will work. Uh, last, a story about difficult conversations. I was just browsing my brain trying to find him. There's, there's several books about difficult conversations, one of which is pretty famous and it was written by four or five authors. Ironically, one of those authors was on the board of an organization April used to work for that was deeply dysfunctional and he was no help whatsoever. Like they, there, were, there were difficult conversations they were not having and the organization eventually went under. Um, so I was like, oh good, glad he wrote that book. Um, anyway, small side note, this, these, these theories don't always work. Um, so with that, let's go back to Lauren, Pete, and Rob. Lauren, are you able to uh, walk Yeah, across? sure. Awesome, thank yeah, you. Yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't have much to say. I'm just super excited to be here. I don't always get to come because uh, it's, I'm trying to reduce my calls in the afternoon for my kids, but I'm just uh, really happy to see you all and to uh, take part in the conversation. It's uh, fascinating as usual, and um, it's great to be back. Yay, thank you. <laughs> thank you for all the, the like many things you're doing. It's amazing. Like Kiko, I was on fire. So that's a great thing. Um, let's go Pete, Rob, Mark. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, lots, lots of cool stuff happening in the, the Federation world of the, the Federated Sovereigns world. Um, top of mind for me, uh, OGM Bootstrap um, is, uh, looks like it's ready to sign the MOU with Lionsburg, which is awesome. Uh, check the stewards channel for a little bit more on that or ask a question in the stewards channel. Um, the Generative Commons is bootstrapping up. Uh, there's a channel for that. Um, Massive do you Wiki. Want to, do you want to explain generative commons for a sec? Uh, yeah, actually, I would point you to the, I, I wrote up a great uh, summary of it in the channel today. So if okay, you're good. interested in the intersection of intellectual property and the commons, or if uh, you're tired of enclosure and want to do commons instead, um, come join us and talk about the generative commons. Um, and read uh, the, the documents that Pete posted in that new channel. Yeah. Sorry, um, I, We're all super excited about it. Um, it, it, it is, although for me, it is one of many super exciting things. So I, I, maybe I'm not conveying the super excitedness about it as much as I, I could. Um, Massive Wiki is going well. Um, I'm. I'm having a, a fun time uh, hooking up with people who are kind of outside of outside of our usual circles, um, and some of them are helping me a lot. So, um, uh, so it's it's going well. Uh, even though I feel like Massive Wiki hasn't moved much in the past week or so, um, uh, it actually has uh, internally, and and that'll of course bubble out into into the rest of the world. Um, Trove is coming along super nicely. Uh, congratulations, Vincent, on, on how well it's looking and, and the stuff that's upcoming. Um, it's awesome and wonderful. Um, Vincent and I are also, every time we get together, we talk about how Miss of Wiki and, and Trove are going to be working together, start to work together already. Um, and, and for that, uh, please feel free to join our Flotilla Friday call tomorrow at 9 a.m. Pacific. Um, uh, there's a private work group right now with a few of us uh, talking about um, income from curating and curated uh, knowledge, information, and wisdom. Um, so some of us either have assets of lots of uh, curated knowledge or tools that work with that. And um, we've gone, we've, it's only been a, sh a few hours of conversation over the past week or and a half or so, but um, we're pretty far along and um, we're not quite ready, I think, to, to ask for more, more co-thinkers, but um, but we're getting there. Um, and I'm, I'm actually super excited about that. And it works really well. Uh, it mashes up really well with the generative commons too. Um, the genesis of that income from curating and curated knowledge, information, wisdom, um, all of us are also committed to nurturing the commons and putting as much of that stuff out into the commons as possible. So. Um, uh, so, you know, that it, it all feels really good. Um, there's some interesting kind of like conceptual stuff uh, fettering amongst the sovereigns um, in different ways. And also had a great talk yesterday with um, uh, <clears throat> um, Benjamin, uh, Ben, about, um, uh, about uh, 
different architectures for, he, he made the observation that um, if I'm in an organization, sometimes it's, it, it feels better if I've got my little, my little wiki all by myself. Um, and then, you know, I don't want to necessarily jump into somebody else's wiki. Um, so we talked about different ways of, of that happens. Um, sometimes uh, CSC Mattermost is a good example of kind of a commons um, of, of information or uh, infrastructure, communication infrastructure, where it actually feels relaxing and generative, maybe is a way to, I, I kind of feel like it, um, that we have uh, in one place, you can kind of pretend that you're just OGM and you only hit a couple channels uh, in Mattermost, or you can um, also be an OGM and Kiko Lab and, and a bunch of other um, formed and less formed kind of uh, entities within the same information commons. So I think that's going to happen with wikis too. Some people, the, the organization wants a wiki that they feel like they can control and it makes more sense for them to be closed. And, um, and maybe there's other situations where they can go talk to a, a larger community in a commons wiki, um, or maybe they can link up with another organization with a closed wiki, and then their wikis might talk and gossip to each other a little bit. The cool thing in talking about that with Ben was that um, uh, massive wiki out of all the other kind of wiki architectures is unnatural at that kind of like, you know, it can either be closed, it can be open, it can different wikis can gossip to each other really well. It can be closed and then later kind of progressively open. So um, I'm super excited about that. And I think that's it for me. Um, Pete, thank you. Uh, a couple things. One, thank you for coming in with like an agenda of stuff that ha that's happened. Thank you more for like your energy and all those things, like moving everything forward at once. I don't know how you do it. I believe you are like octopus man, including the fact that that only like 20% of an octopus's brains or understanding is actually inside of its head. It's, it, the arms are all pretty independent and smart. So maybe, I don't know. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, third, I, when, I, when we opened this call and there weren't as many people, I put out an ask for somebody for OGM who can start to pick up some of the things that you're doing around project management and note-taking and uh, sort of, sort of uh, stewarding the stewards and uh, seeing, seeing our activities through. So I, I want to repeat that call now and, uh, and propagate it. Um, Gil, the numbers will become less mysterious in a second. Uh, I will get to Mark in check-ins. So let's go Rob, Mark, Judy, and then uh, the mystery shall be revealed. Jerry, are you saying Pete is your octopus teacher? You could sort of metaphorically say that, and it would sort of work, except I'm not like holding my breath while talking to him all the time. And hopefully I'm not going to die in a year. Yeah, yeah. Or get eaten by a shark almost. Yeah, uh, sorry for the flat spoiler, everybody. Um, cool. I'm so sorry. Um, there was something happening outside. Is it me now or somebody else? It's Rob, then Mark, then Judy. Cool. Um, well, very excited to be on the call. I uh, typically have a uh, conflict at this time slot, which was canceled today. So I'm uh, happy to be here. I've been in and around uh, OGM for a while and I help uh, Pete behind the scenes on some of the things. And that's always uh, interesting to me. And uh, uh, I get a lot of inspiration from this group. So I'm glad to be here today in person. Uh, for those of you I haven't met before or interacted with, I'm a consultant, kind of a management uh, technology design consultant in Washington, DC. Uh, my wife and I own a company of about 50 people and we primarily serve uh, the federal government, primarily Homeland Security and primarily within that FEMA um, with uh, a, lots of other, other clients along those primarilys. Um, so we, uh, um, one interesting project that we're sort of incubating now is one of the things we support are the uh, alerts that you all get on your phone, uh, whether they be uh, natural disaster alerts or um, uh, amber alerts. Uh, we support FEMA. Uh, FEMA provides the plumbing for all of that to happen. Uh, that system is called IPAWS, I P A W S. And um, all of the counties across the country are connected to that. So counties and the National Weather Service are the primary uh, originator of alerts. It goes into this plumbing and then it figures out whose TVs and phones and 
uh, radios should should get the alerts. So it's pretty pretty interesting system. Um, it was originally designed as the presidential communication system. So the president is able to go to radio towers all across the country and they tap in the secret code and pick up the phone and would be able to broadcast uh, presidential communication to the whole country at once, <clears throat> which is kind of interesting. So that a little sidebar on that, or a little reason for me talking about it is we have, are thinking about um, kind of what Jerry was talking about, of what if Facebook was designed for citizens? So <clears throat> something in the space of community organizing, um, alerts, i.e. getting real-time information, and next door. So somewhere in that space, we're exploring how can we how can we build some sort of glue that helps uh, uh, connect communities, helps 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 people organize communities, and helps people share information. Um, next door does that well in some ways and not so well in other ways, and it's obviously a a commercial commercially provided service. Um, so we're really in the early stages of that, um, but it, it's kind of interesting. Um, second, I, I went to my company office yesterday for the first time in, in a long time, and it, it, felt, <clears throat> it felt weird. And then it made me stop and think of how, maybe not how easily, but how much we've all been reprogrammed in the last year uh, to kind of, uh, something that I've been doing for 20 years now feels odd or different or whatever. So it's, it's, uh, it's interesting to think about how do we shift ways of being, ways of thinking, ways of operating both um, in, in populations, but also individually, you know, my personal habits and how do I start the day and how do I, how do I, how do I experience life? Um, so all that was kind of an interesting thought, uh, thought, and um, just a coincidence. Or, or uh, we were talking earlier about difficult conversations, and we had done executive coaching in our company with about ten of us um, on difficult conversations. So it was interesting uh, for us. It, it's just so important for the company to have our people communicating and working well together that we. Um, invested in a in a coach to well, it's someone's been working with us for a long time, but we did this new program for about six uh, six sessions over four months and concluded it yesterday. Um, and uh, lastly, um, I'm uh, a passionate about Bitcoin, so been kind of engaged in lots of conversations following on uh, Elon Musk's uh, ill ill informed tweets and uh, kind of uh, helping people understand some of the ins and outs of cryptocurrency, which I know uh, some people here are, are interested in. Um, so that's kind of it, a menu of things and uh, all, all uh, lots of good ideas going on in my head. You, you saw the news about the Chinese government's new policy on cryptocurrency? And yeah, I think they've banned, they've banned cryptocurrency about 10 times now, so. Uh, it is they're they're an ongoing uh, ongoing evolution. Yeah, very good article in the Wall Street Journal on Tuesday on the state of cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. It, if, if people want to catch up and in a three minute read, really really useful article. Cool. It's been um, a fun week to be a, a a Bitcoin participant. Super fun. Um, it depends what fun means. Is that is that it, Mike? Um, brief thing, on, Rob, on what you said about going back to the office and how we've reset. I feel like early in lockdown, I somehow internalized the plot of The Martian. And, and I feel like Matt Damon outdoors, every time I go out, uh, every time I've been outdoors, it's, it's now going away. I'm, I'm double vaxxed, but, and things are slowly returning to normal. But, but I had this feeling like everything was toxic and could kill you. And it's, it, you, you bury that pretty deep in the system quickly. And, and hitting undo on that is very hard. So... Um, let us go to Mark Carranza and then Judy and Gil and Mike. Um, hi there. Um, oh, good morning or, or good time wherever you are. Um, 
I'm uh, primarily an artist uh, who's interested in the aesthetics of the experience of knowing, of being human, kind of an aesthetics of anthropology, of, of being or, and becoming, of learning, um, how it feels to learn. Um, since 1984, I've been basically listening writing or reading writing or thinking writing with a computer system that basically I type something and hit enter, I type something else and hit enter, and it basically cross-links those two its. So those it and it are knit, and basically having done that 17 million times, um, I have the world's largest, um, uh, possibly the world's largest weird uh, self-portrait or knowledge uh personal, personal knowledge web personal like what's, what's web. your favorite what's your favorite descriptor um i call it a uh mx uh the letters m and x for memory experiment and it's, borrowing from the memx which which inspired you I, I did not know memx existed oh right and i chose those i chose those for um basically changing the meaning of ronald reagan's uh missiles on trains I, I, I wanted to basically take a meme and fuck with it, <laughs> fuck with it hard. It didn't quite work, but uh, basically it turned out that, uh, you know, a meme exchange um, would be another kind of notion or a meaning crossover that when you take any notion like Jerry and Gil or dog and cat or black and white, there's a tension between those singular two notions that is uncountable and infinite and to basically take that incredible mystery of what is a jerry that we iconically recognize and have tacit knowledge of and go to a gill who we immediately recognize and have tacit knowledge of and say the relation between gill and jerry is dynamic, uncountable, unputable into words, but we can use words and words, oddly enough, are things that are digital or can be digital. And so I am attempting to theoretically deal with the unit of, the basic unit of sense-making, which is a sign, another sign, and a human putting them together a particular human at a particular time in a particular database and having billions of those across the planet. So if I type in OGM call Thursday, May 20th, 2021, 8 a.m., and I type everything I hear and hit enter, basically I get this side effect of this huge list, which I will continue to uh, uh, put on. And apologies to Lauren for uh, not being able to do it uh, real time in her amazing and uh, Charles Bass's amazing uh, Kiko lab calls. Um, I am recovering from uh, lymphoma. Wow, and, congratulations. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's just, uh, you know, um, all thanks to uh, allopathic medicine <laughs> and the poisons that kill off my immune system. Uh, uh, to the point that uh, the cancer dies first and I still survive. Um, I may not, 25% uh, of people, according to a New York Times article, do not develop antibodies to the COVID vaccine. So I'm participating in a study to see if that works and still being careful. And um, I am almost, uh, say June 1st, about to rejoin uh, my uh, employer, the Internet Fucking Archive. Hot um, damn. Love the Internet uh, Fucking Archive. Yes. Which, <laughs> they're my heroes. Brewster's. I'm convinced that 200 years from now, people are going to look back and think of Brewster Kale as the Benjamin Franklin of our, of our era. Um, let's, so. let's hope we can all contribute in, in some small way. Um, so, um, boy, um, I've got a set of challenges. Um, where with the with the MX, the size of the corpus, the 
2.3 million unique text strings and 14 million links in between them since 1984 in a DOS program is the proverbial elephant in the room. I cannot have a discussion that seems to point to what I'm really interested in, which is an instrument to think with, with words that, you know, that basically is driven by your experience of meaning inside your own head. So I don't really care about the millions of thoughts that I have over the years. They're only important really to me. And it's the inspiration or pro providing a tool to other people so they can have this dynamic feedback of thinking in a free association processor or basically a simple tool to simply record the utterances that they encounter in the world, like I've done and posted in the Mattermost for this call, that that's really the heart of this. And people keep on in conversation saying, oh, we want to do this, you know, heuristic modeling based on your data. No, it is basically, how is it that we pay attention to the way thinking feels? to the way being feels. What does it feel like? How could it feel like? You know, what does it feel like to think? You're just accidentally, yeah, good. Yeah, just accidentally. So instead of say, linking VC companies to the names of the partners in the VCs, et cetera, my canonical notion is, quote, I wish I had a better relationship with my mother. Now, for everybody, that means something different. And the notions in a list with that title are uncountable. But if we as a community, you know, for every possible expression, have the connection to the expressions that make sense, moving from that expression to the next expression, that weird kind of multi-dimensional database with the time, the date, the location, the person, and how many times that person has expressed that over time, how many people, a set of people have expressed similar things over time, basically gathering vocabulary in a repository, not of narrative, but of individual expressions and one at a time, their connection to another expression. Mm -hmm. Has that been difficult? But I continue. And uh, thanks, Jerry. Um, uh, I'm learning how to ask to ask for help. That's fabulous. Um, and very glad you're here, Mark. And I remember visiting you, meeting you, and then visiting you and, and listening to you. And you had been doing what I had started doing at that time with the brain. You'd been already doing it for a decade plus. Um, super interesting. I have a, a series of short questions for you. First, what are the numbers at the left of each line in MX mean? Um, in that particular output, um, basically it's the number of connected nodes to that string. Oh, okay. So, you know, in a static output, the network is hidden. But basically, you know, the single layer of a single list um, it has the indication that there are deeper connections there. Anything with a number three in front of it is basically connected to the list, the time, and the date. So basically nothing deeper. So three is a, three is a not very connected node then? Three is a node that's completely untyped before into the repository. It's a Google bomb, so to speak. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a thought seed that along with anything that even has 300,000 links to it already, it's an open list. It's an open hyper list. Yep. So you add nodes that refer to a sentence, uh, an expression, even any digital string, give it a unique number and take that number and link it to another number and crossways link the next number to the previous number, A to B and B to A. So oh. 
Mark, I was going to ask what's the largest number if three is the lowest. Maybe you just answered that with 300,000 or? Um, it's, it's in the 30,000s. 30, 30,000s? 30, cool. Yeah. Um, so do you know Marc-Antoine Fahal? I do not. I do not know how to even spell that. Uh, I, I, we will we will give you his name. He's in the free jury's brain calls on Mondays. You, given how you talked about MX, I think you and he would have a really fruitful and interesting conversation. Are you familiar with the cult of Rome? R O A M, not ancient Rome, but rather R O A M. Um, yes, and I actually am uh, friends with uh, Connor. Uh, yeah. Um, cool, because Rome is the closest thing I've seen to sort of what you've built. And, and I think, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Mark, you wrote the code for MX years ago, and you, like it's, it, you're the only person on earth using this, correct? That is completely correct. Yeah, it's custom for you. It's, it was your sort of art and mind, you know, mindful note-taking project. Uh, but I think there's some, some really interesting things uh, sort of in the Rome community that could learn from you or whatever. And I'm, I'm a... I'm a interested in the fact that you re react so negatively to maybe other people analyzing your data in some way, because you have created a trove um, in lowercase, uh, a rich trove of, of something, right? Um, the last person who analyzed my data, I had asked Pete Kaminsky if he knew of Dan Kaminsky. He died. <laughs> so I'm like, ah! <laughs> I am so sad because I love Dan Kaminsky, security researcher, one of the most brilliant, loving, and yeah. caring people I've I've ever I've ever met. And uh, I shared a uh, a co-working space with him, and uh, he died at forty-two a couple months ago. Yeah. Um. So yeah, there might be a little of uh, woo-woo kind of. Uh, scariness there but um basically i'm working with wendy elford to kind of take this and put it into a piece of software that she um works with and um what what what's important to me at the moment is oops no i didn't mute again what i have is a single layered network. I can only link Jerry Mikowski to Lauren Nignon once. But that link in a phenomenological experience of living happens hundreds of times. And so if I have the icon Jerry Mikowski, I think of that iconic representation 20 times a year or, or more, and more now, now that I'm getting back into OGM, but your wife thinks of it 40,000 times a year. And it's the additive sort of event of thought, person, time in a repository. Um, you know, you can think of a thought 50 times within a particular day, within a particular hour. And if you, if we have something that tracks us, then we get this kind of additive and summable kind of record that creates patterns as a side effect, not as something that is driven by algorithm, but it's driven by recording of phenomenology. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this is a very difficult topic to get across to people used to computer programming and used to you know algorithmic information extraction systems um, convolutional neural networks um, so i don't find it interesting that there's meaning in what i've done i find it interesting that someone someday and hopefully many people will be able to use again the enhanced version that is multiple summing and additive um, and have that interface as a trusted part and secure part of their daily life in kind of a not high art, but low art that improves the experience of everyday life starting from childhood. So they have a lifelong thought repository. And I could give a shit about the you know, meaning of my own brain because I engage with it 
every day for 30 plus years. Mm -hmm. I don't care what the graph looks like. I don't care if my- But what if other people found this immensely useful? Wouldn't you want to like open source your data or leave it in your will that your that your database be, is be made public and available? Something? I do, Jerry, but it would be kind of a scale problem where let other people worry about the scale. Well, no, seriously, yeah, like like there's people who don't worry about millions of records of anything. Like, please allow me to finish. Oh, sorry, that's okay. If I have two million. 2.5 million at the most, that's 2.3 million over since 1984. And if I were to release this successfully over the internet, there would be an alphabetical list of 2.3 million thoughts every 40 seconds, rather than just me over 35 years. That's the type of scale and thinking big that I would prefer to do rather than, pardon my French, fuck around with algorithmic processing um, in um, uh, language processing models of these single layer associations. Um, yeah, anyway, to answer Gil, it's about 150 on average, uh, about an hour and a half. So I add 150 new links a day, um, and of all links, 85% are new links, i.e. the threes, and they don't refer um, to things I've already typed in in those 35 years. That's why I think, I believe, for other people, that same kind of average of something, some new string being created and added to a repository is basically going to be, um, you know, the, the predominant experience rather than, you know, the language of, of others being encountered and repeated over and over again. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm losing kind of a focus and energy. That's here. all right. That's all right. Thank you. Uh, so I, uh, and we have, we've talked, very few times over lots of years. And I think I underappreciated the aesthetic or artistic and emotional components of your work, which I now feel I understand a bit better. So I appreciate that a lot. Uh, glad you're here. We are running out of time because several of us must bounce at the half hour. Uh, and that'll be sort of 90 minutes for a call. And even though this call started small, we did not make it through everybody who was there at the beginning of the call as check-in, which is okay. Uh, it's not our it's not our goal to be complete on making sure we heard from everybody. I hope that's okay with people who feel like um, we didn't get to them. And uh, we'll start there. Uh, we'll try to start backwards or with the people who didn't get found this week, next week. But uh, there's lots going on. This is exciting. Um, so I think with that, maybe, uh, does anybody have a closing thought given where our conversation went? And then we'll just uh, wrap from this call. Uh, Gil. Very quickly, tying together the ending and the beginning, I, I, I found myself wandering, wondering, as Mark was talking, about the value that these kinds of tools could bring to the um, kinds of difficult conversations that Ken and others were talking about at the beginning of the call. And there's, Ken opened up for us the somatic dimension of it. This is another dimension, and that might be a fascinating game to explore. I, by which do you mean, for example, if multiple people were keeping notes the way Mark keeps notes? I, and, I, don't, I have no, I have no idea. Okay. By that, I just, I just felt their resonance there that might be worth exploring in some way, somehow, by somebody, sometime. Awesome. Thank you, Mark. I'm, I'm not nominating Mark and Ken to do that, but they yeah, might. Fine. No, um, the, 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 the difficulty for me in expressing and helping people understand, again, Jerry, even at the 999 kind of uh, uh, possible uh, connections, is that a tool for thinking that does kind of interactive um, free association or dwelling and focusing or expanding um, is experiential. And mm, basically allows one to play with expressions 
and expressing and refining expression and, and growing strings longer and more complex and growing lists longer and, and more complex. And it's, it's very difficult to describe. Um, and, and so in a future thing, I'll, I'll share screen and, and whatnot, but um, it's not always taking notes. It's more listening and then when you go back to what you see, listening to what happens now in the new present, even though you, you know, wrote something back you know, earlier today or 50 years ago. So basically tuning into your own experience of a meme that pops up either at random or on your self-directed purpose. Mm -hmm. um, so thinking about, you know, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, thousands of words. And, and, you know, there are algorithmic things that we can do to basically, you know, deepen our interactions with our own language. But at the moment, I'm more interested in what people create in their minds, which mm -hmm. is huge. And we cannot express all at once, but only you know, bits at a time, either in a narrative or, or for me, what would be pre-narrative are these A to B and B to A, indexical links of iconic meme or string expressions, you know, in a digital hybrid extended mind. And with that, you have the last word on this call. I appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for another, another great call. Thank you, everybody. Ciao. Great. Bye. Hi, Judy. <laughs> Hi, Vincent. Hi, Rob. Hi, Michael. Oh, man. That was tough. Anyway, have a good night. Good day. Bye-bye. <laughs>